hear dial-up internet is making a comeback. I'm getting a Juno account for $29.95. You don't need to spend that. Get the AOL disc. It's a thousand hours free. A thousand hours? A thousand hours. Every year, people will make lists about things that you should pay attention to in the upcoming year. Whether it be fashion, you know, what kind of shirt should you wear, what kind of pants should you wear. or maybe what kind of TV shows are coming up, or the top five movies you need to see next year. And the same holds true for developers. Because we build things with specific tooling and specific ways of doing things, and if those things go out of trend, it can affect our employment a little bit to some degree. So it makes it very prudent to look at what are things that I need to pay attention to. Is there something else I need to know about? Some kind of trend that can impact me either positively or negatively. So we've put together five things that we think you should pay attention to in 2020. Now these five things aren't the only five things, it's just five things that we think you need to pay attention to. And in case you don't wanna stick around for the whole video, I'll give you the five things right now. I think you need to pay attention to WebAssembly, cross-platform mobile development, serverless functions, Docker and Kubernetes, and specifically learning something about one of the major cloud vendors. So if you don't know how to deploy your code to Azure or Google or AWS, you need to start looking into those, those kind of publication pipelines as well. So let's get started with WebAssembly. WebAssembly is a hot new tech that everyone's talking about, and so you've probably heard a little bit about it unless you've been living on a rock or you've been on a really long project and you haven't come up for air recently. But just in case you're that guy or that girl that has not really paid attention to this, I want to tell you what WebAssembly is real quickly. WebAssembly allows us to take a language, compile it, and then execute that in the browser. So this gives us near native speed, so it's way more performant than what currently we can get from JavaScript. In addition to speed, is we also get type safety from some a lot of these languages. And also our application is contained inside the browser. So when you have a lot of these JavaScript projects that have a lot of all these dependencies, you don't necessarily have that problem when you're running something inside of WebAssembly. It's kind of contained and packaged up and executes inside the browser. So all of those are beneficial and very strong reasons to, um, to look at this. Now, how can or what kind of languages are out there right now? Well, obviously, you can look at things like C++ is running in WebAssembly, Rust is running in WebAssembly, and then there's something called a little known project called TVM, where you can actually run Java, Scala. There's also Kotlin can also run in WebAssembly, but there's also the one that I'm most interested in, the one that gets the most press is probably C Sharp from Microsoft with something called Blazor. Blazor is exciting to me personally, and it's also exciting to a lot of people in the developer community at large. It's very far along and it will be available, commercially available, probably in May 2020. Right now it's in something called Preview. But if you take the time to open up Visual Studio and run a Blazor client-side project, you'll see that the tooling is pretty far along and it's pretty easy to do. WebAssembly is something that you need to look at because if there's new Greenfield projects coming out this summer, they may be doing those in WebAssembly. Now they may be using Rust or C++ or Blazor or whatever, but you need to be up to speed on what that is and how that impacts what you do. Now, does this mean that JavaScript's gonna die? I don't think so. I don't think it's the death of JavaScript. I think that um, these projects will be a slow adoption towards doing um, languages other than JavaScript as we go, and there'll be a lot of room for both of these languages to coexist, but you're probably going to start brushing up on those skills and being more skilled in case those opportunities come along that you can take them. So look at WebAssembly this year, and I think where C Sharp fits in this, Blazor from Microsoft is very far along and it's definitely something worth to look at. Mobile development has been a very hot place for a while now. As we know, we're building Android apps, we're also with Java or Kotlin, and we're also building um, iOS apps with something called Swift or formerly Objective-C. And so those have been traditionally what uh, dev shops are doing is they're building two teams or two silos if they need to produce something for iOS and for Android that pretty much have two development teams going. Now, what I think the trend that you're going to see in 2020 is as the enterprise more adopts 
um, enterprise mobile applications, um, they're going to be less inclined to say, hey, I need an iOS team and I need an Android team. I need one team to do that all. And the, what the dev manager is going to want is to make that a compile option or a publish option. And that's where cross-platform mobile development comes in. It's a way for you to build an application that will run on iOS and Android natively. Now, currently right now, you're looking at Java on Android. The one thing that you should be concerned of, and on a side note is, Google now has adopted Kotlin as the preferred language for development. And if you're a Java guy and you're just doing Android development, that's definitely something you need to look into picking up Kotlin because that could reduce your ability to make jobs later on in the year um, as Kotlin becomes more and more preferred as projects roll out. Not saying Java's dead. Don't get me wrong. Plenty of opportunities out there if you're a Java developer. I'm just saying that on the Android side, this could shift. Now, when we look at the cross-platform vendors out there, we can look at what Google themselves are doing and they're using Flutter. And so that should also tell you something about what they believe as well. So they believe that you should be able to write code and deploy to the platform of your choice or both. And so as you go down through this vendors, you'll see Flutter, you can see React Native, and you also can see things like Kotlin Native, which is very, very new and not as far as long. And as well as where C-sharp fits in this is Xamarin. Um, we're seeing in my consulting company, a lot of move for people trying to build Xamarin projects because they can use C-sharp and they can use C-sharp to deploy to iOS and Android. So I think one thing that you're going to be doing this year is looking at cross-platform mobile development. I think that's going to be a hot thing. Which of these tools are going to win out? I'm going to leave that up to you and different people will implement it in different ways. I like Xamarin, but I can definitely see where Flutter could take off. I can definitely see where React Native would take off. If you are just in the iOS camp over here and you just know Swift, or you're just in the Java camp and you just know Java or Kotlin, I really want to encourage you to look at something of these cross-platform um, tooling so that you can take these new jobs as they come out in 2020. So if you've been writing web applications for a long time, you know that deploying your application is always kind of a problem. You gotta manage the server, you gotta manage the database, you gotta manage all of this kind of infrastructure. And so a lot of times, if you're in a smaller shop to a medium-sized shop, you have to be part developer, part network admin, part server admin, to be able to get your application to production. Um, serverless architecture is, a, is gonna take that and make that easier for you. Now, I wanna stress, and if you know, if you're building um, service architecture project right now, it's not a hammer that you can hit every nail with. It is specific to your situation, but what you're gonna see is a lot of um, applications being moved over to this architecture or kind of like architecture design pattern. And you do have to change the way you write your code, you have to change the way you, you structure your applications, but what it allows you to do is basically deploy your application without any concern of what the hardware is, manage your server OS or anything like that. So it makes your deployments that much easier. Now what you're gonna see is how can you do this or what are the vendors out there that you're looking at? Um, you know, obviously there's um, AMBA or AMBA, Amazon Lambda functions, and you also have someone like Netlify functions. All the major cloud providers have them, including Microsoft Azure, which has Azure functions. Now, I do want to say this is kind of where C Sharp fits in with um, Azure functions and with Visual Studio. You can write your function in C Sharp um, over on AWS. That's going to be in something like JavaScript or Go or something like that. Specifically with the tooling on Azure, I find that really easy to do and local debugging is really cool. Now, all of these toolings will improve as this gets more rolled out and they put more time in it. But right now, I just kind of like the way the Azure functions and the tooling all work together. And since I know C Sharp, it makes it real easy for me to deploy that way. But you can write these things in Netlify functions. You can write these in, um, in Amazon if you're already there and you're already um, using AWS for your deployments. It makes that an easy place for you to go to. So what you need to do to take away from this is you need to start looking into serverless functions, write a hello world serverless function like this week or next week, and be ready to take on those types of jobs in 2020. Continue with the deployment theme um, when we're talking about serverless functions, Docker is something else that you need 
need to pay attention to. Now, Docker is what we know as containers, which means that I can deploy my application in a container, and then that container can reside on an OS that's not necessarily native to my application. For example, I can take an ASP.NET application that runs on ISS and put that inside Docker and then run that Docker on something like Linux, and that's really cool. So that means I can take my C Sharp or my .NET Core application, put it inside of Docker, and then run that on any kind of host that I want. And that allows me to be kind of like platform independent, and I don't have to run it on a Windows box or anything like that. Now, the other thing that I think you need to start thinking into is if you're working for larger shops and you have scalability issues, is Kubernetes, which allows you to host multiple Dockers, orchestrate that, and scale those things out at scale. There's a little bit of um, knowledge that you need to acquire there as of, of far as getting your application into a Docker or into a container. So it's something that you need to pay attention to because there'll be jobs out there, hey, have you deployed to containers? Are you utilizing containers in your deployments? And it's just something that you need to pay attention to. Now, what's really exciting is where does C Sharp fit in is because now .NET Core can literally run on any kind of host because of things like Docker and Kubernetes. So no longer do you have to manage an ISS web server, you just kind of deploy that to your container and push that out to your host. And that's very exciting for you as a developer if you're doing C Sharp or ASP.NET. But even if you're not and you're doing with other tooling or other languages, they're going to want to pretty much push you into containers as well because it isolates you from the hosting environment and you can make sure that your, your application will run like it's intended. So take a look at Docker, containers, and Kubernetes. Now the trend for 2020, you know, the cloud is a thing. Yes, we all know that. The, the cloud has been a thing for several, several years now. But I think that um, as you look at these cloud providers, you're seeing that the capabilities are growing and the types of things you're doing are becoming more complex the things that you can achieve while also making it simultaneously easier to do. And that's what's exciting about a lot of these cloud vendors. Now, I think what you need to focus on in 2020 is knowing what the capabilities of these individual clouds are. And I really think there's two major vendors out there. Obviously, there's Azure for Microsoft and AWS. Um, I know that Google has a cloud and I know that IBM has a cloud, but those are the two main ones. And if you're starting from scratch today, I would pick Azure, but I wouldn't fault you if you started looking into AWS either. Either one of those, I think you're starting from scratch, are good to look at, and they're all doing the same types of things. Now, all of these companies are investing millions, hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars into these platforms to make them do more complex things. So I want you to think about the cloud, not just hosting your full stack web app or hosting just your serverless function. I want you to think about this. There's other things that you can utilize on the cloud that you may not have thought about, like machine learning, AI, vision, all of these really complex things that now is available to you as a developer. What I would encourage you to do this year is to take a look at what these um, capabilities are of these different clouds and these more complex services. Write some Hello World code or some sample projects in those to investigate what they're capable of doing so that if you're a dev manager or you wanna apply for a job, that you can take on these newer types of projects that are coming down the pipe. And you'll need to know how to get them to run on these individual platforms. So make sure that you're looking into these cloud vendors this year. 2020 is gonna be an exciting year for people that are in the industry of coding or knowing how to code. It also can be the year that you start your coding journey. Um, I think that the capabilities that are coming down make developers even more valuable than they were last year. The types of things that you can build, the types of problems you can solve is almost limitless and the types of jobs you can take is limitless if you know how to code. I think it's a very exciting for 2020. If you're just starting your learning journey and you don't know how you're gonna do it, here at Coder Founder, we'd be honored to be your your teacher, your mentor, and your coach to break you into that first software development job. You can go to coderfounder.com slash job roadmap. But I hope this helps and I encourage you to take some of these and really develop your skills in 2020. Good luck and keep coding.